Good morning, Grace. It's time to start our worship by singing together our welcome song. Please don your masks. Stand and sing with me our welcome song, Descend, O Spirit. Let's all stand and sing together. Descend, O Spirit, purging flame, brand us this day with Jesus' name. Confirm our faith, consume our doubt, sign us as Christ, within, without, sign us as Christ, within, without. Children of our King, then send us forth in Jesus' name. Then send us forth in Jesus' name. Good morning. Welcome to Grace Presbyterian Church. My name is Nick Swan. I'm the assistant pastor here at Grace. And our mission is to welcome our neighbors to grow together in Christ, to serve God and our community and our world. If you'd like more information on the church, you can check us out at gracenorthshore.org. There's information about the church. You can fill out a Connect card under the Welcome tab. Uh, you can also check out our Grace Connect email. You can sign up for that. That's where you'll find out information each week about our services, ministries, everything that's going on here at Grace. We're going to begin our service this week uh, with our call to worship from Psalm 112. We're going to be reading this responsively, so please join me as we read our call to worship. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the one who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commandments. For the righteous will never be moved, but will be remembered forever. The righteous are not afraid of bad news. Their hearts are firm, trusting in the Lord. Our hearts are steady. We will not be afraid. Let us pray together. Uh, our glorious God, Father, Son, and Spirit, we gather together today to praise your name. Father, I pray that you would guard us from fear and that we would be steady and firm in you because in you we have hope and salvation regardless of our circumstances. May we trust in you this morning. May we be edified this morning. And by your spirit, would you strengthen us as your people, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. We'll continue now in song. Please put your masks on and sing with me. Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus. Oh, the Oh, 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 oh,
we come now to confess our sins to God, and I want us to do so considering the first verse of, oh, the deep love, deep, deep love of Jesus. Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus, vast, unmeasured, boundless, free, rolling as a mighty ocean in its fullness over me. Underneath me, all around me, is the current of thy love, leading onward, leading homeward to thy glorious rest above. As we come to confess our sins this morning, we do not do so to earn God's favor. He already loves us and he surrounds us as a deep ocean in his love and his mercy and his forgiveness. And so as we confess our sins together and then silently confess our sins to God, be aware that you're doing so in an ocean of God's unending love, mercy, and grace. Please join me this morning as we read our confession of sin together. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we might delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Please take a moment now to silently confess your sins. Hear now the assurance of God's pardon from Philippians 1, 6. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. We have just now come before our Father to ask for forgiveness. We are now living in the goodness of that forgiveness of being at peace with God. And so now we pass that peace of Christ to one another. So please stand and greet one another. You can turn to your family. May the peace of Christ be with you. You can turn to those around you. May the peace of Christ be with you. Peace of Christ be with you, Marshall Brown. Peace of Christ be with you, Chris Reed. (laughs) All right, Chris Reed is now going to come forward for our children's sermon. It's just my height. Me and Pastor Marshall are the same height, Uh, so this is good right here. Uh, Good morning, Grace. It's great to be with you this Sunday. This uh, past week, I had the privilege of joining our children for our VBS here at the church. I'm seeing some familiar VBS faces. Uh, So for our children's sermon, I'd just like to give a quick recap um, of what we learned this week. We dove into the book of Jonah, and we saw that God not only called Jonah, But Jonah disobeyed the Lord, but God forgave Jonah and the Ninevites who he was supposed to preach to. And this story can be captured in Psalm 145.8. And if you guys remember it, you can say it with me. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. So God is gracious. He's good. Even when we don't deserve it, he's compassionate. So he sees us when we're in trouble. But not only that, he feels it and he moves to action. He's slow to anger. He's patient with us and he's rich in love. The Lord's love is abundant. And so as we cling to these truths this school year, it will uh, carry us in great times and bad times. So I'd like to pray over our children um, right now. Would you bow your heads with me? Dear Jesus, uh, I thank you uh, just that we have the opportunity to gather. I thank you for such a great week of VBS, and I ask that you would help us to uh, cling to those truths, that you are gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, and rich in love. Throughout our days, um, we thank you uh, just for the story of Jonah, and we ask that you um, just point us uh, to Christ each and every single moment of every day. In Jesus' name, amen.
I'll raise that, Chris. Uh, well, my name is Marshall Brown. Welcome to those of you joining us online. We're so glad that you are with us. Uh, my name is Marshall Brown. I'm the senior pastor here at Grace, and I will be teaching. I do want to say uh, real quickly, it was a great week for Vacation Bible School. Chris was the main teacher. And I just want to shout out kudos, especially to all the volunteers, but maybe above all to uh, Diana Williams. Uh, she'll be with us in our next service, and I'll honor her appropriately when she's at the, the second service. Uh, but she did an amazing job. I got such great feedback from uh, the moms, from the kids. Uh, it, was, it was amazing. In a time of a pandemic, to pull off a VBS, uh, it was just amazing. So please be praying for Diana. She needs rest. Uh, let me go on record publicly as saying I've told her to take the next week off. We'll see if she uh, listens uh, to her boss. We'll see. I don't know. Diana's pretty hardworking. Let me read this passage uh, from the book of James, and then I'll pray for us. We're starting a study today of the letter of James. This is God's word. If you're following online, you can find the PDF uh, for this on our website, I believe, under the welcome tab. This is God's word. James chapter 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes and the dispersion. Greetings. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him who asks in faith with no doubting for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. That person must not suppose he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation. Because like a flower of the grass he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass its flower falls and its beauty perishes, so also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. It's given to us in love. Let me pray. Our great God, as we move now into this new study of the book of James, which we'll be studying for most of the fall, we pray that the words of James and the words of my mouth would be pleasing to you, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Meet us, God, even in the tough things that James has to say us, and help us to see the grace that is ours in the name of your Son, in whose name we pray. Well, the book of James, if you've been around the church for a while, James has a little bit of a reputation. He has frustrated and bedeviled theologians, most notably probably Martin Luther, who really struggled with the book of James. How do we make sense of this book? But as much as James has created problems for theologians, historically James has been loved by the church and by we ordinary Christians. Because among other things, James is practical, he's very clear, and in many ways, he is very concise. He's also very much a preacher. The book of James is so evocative. You can almost hear him. The metaphors are so just, they're evocative. They're a billowing sea, a withered flower, a face in a mirror, a bit in the horse's mouth, the rudder of a ship, a destructive forest fire, pure spring water, the arrogant business person, corroded metal, moth-eaten clothes. It's very evocative. Interestingly, and not for reasons that I'll tell you, not maybe that surprising, more than any other New Testament book, the book of James echoes the words and the teachings of Jesus himself. And that's not surprising because if you look at chapter 1, the very first half, the first verse, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's several James in the New Testament, but most scholars agree this is a man named James the Just. Uh, who was actually the leader of the church at Jerusalem, uh, particularly during the crisis of Acts chapter 15. Church history has it that he was martyred in the 60s, either 62 or 69. Uh, they think he was actually thrown from the temple and stoned. That's tradition. That's not in the scriptures. But most famously, this is most likely James, the half-brother 
of Jesus, the half-brother of Jesus. There's several speculations as to how that is the case, but most think that Mary and Joseph had Jesus first, and then after Jesus was born, they had James and other brothers and sisters. So he'd be the half-brother of Jesus, which makes it remarkable. Think of Je Jesus as your older brother. Just think of that weirdness. Let's start there. Uh, but then to write a letter to make no mention of the fact that Jesus is your half-brother, but then to call yourself, verse 1, a slave of that person. I have brothers and sisters. I can't imagine calling myself their slave. And yet James here in chapter 1 says that he is a slave, a servant of his older half-brother, Jesus Christ. A little more background here. The second half of verse 1 tells us this book is written to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. What that means is this is written to Jewish Christians, most likely in Palestine and Syria, in the mid-40s, 40s AD, after the mid-40s, and they have been dispersed, they have been displaced in two ways. First, they've been removed, most likely from Jerusalem, perhaps because of the persecution that's outlined in, in Acts chapter 8. And imagine you're dispersed in that way. You have had to move very quickly because of oppression to a new place. You go to a new place with your own language, your own people. You don't have a job. You don't have a home. Poverty and oppression would have been your reality. That's much of the background of the suffering of James chapter 1. But they are also displaced because, like we, they are not home. They are not in heaven, that is. And that's a regular theme in James, even as we will see this morning, a longing for our heavenly home because we have been dispersed, displaced. Now, the displaced status of these Jewish Christians has brought to the surface basic Christian spiritual issues, okay? Their, their dispersed status has brought to the surface things in their life, not unlike the way the pandemic that we're facing now has brought to the surface underlying issues. In James, those issues include temptation, how we deal with money, how we think about our tongue and use our tongue, our, our voice, our language, favoritism, and unchecked anger. But in dealing with those, James seems to jump around. Again, he's like a preacher. I told Nick this morning, in many ways, the text I just read actually feels like four different sermons. Uh, but we're going to try to tie it together. And I think the reason we can tie it together is actually because the issue beneath all of the issues in the book of James is what he calls a divided heart, double-mindedness, a divided heart. As we said two weeks ago, the chief human problem, in fact, the chief human reality is the human heart in conflict with itself. And I want us to see that this same idea is here in James, and it's actually all through this James. He calls it double-minded, which is actually a term that he, is, he appears to have created for his own purposes. It's the Greek word dipsikos, and he is translated here double-minded. Look with me at verses 6 through 8, the second half of verse 6. The one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. That person must not suppose he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. He is dipsychos, double-minded, to be of two minds, to be of two selves. And this idea is all over the book of James, and I would argue all over Christianity and the New Testament. You're double-minded if, James 1.23, you're a hearer of the word and not a doer. You are double-minded if, James 1.26, you are not able to bridle your tongue. You're double-minded if you uh, have faith without works. That's James chapter 2. And maybe the classic statement of double-mindedness is in James chapter 4. What causes quarrels and fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? Double-mindedness. Do you feel it? So double-mindedness is the issue that James is addressing throughout the book, throughout the book, which is why the goal, the goal for James is that we would be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. That's verse 4. The goal is a united heart, an undivided heart, a whole heart, which is to say a heart like God's. One of the main themes of the Gospel of James, or the letter according to James, is the unity of God. The God, to quote James 1.17, with whom there is no variation or shadow. God is one. He is, he is unified in his heart and in himself. There's no conflict within God. And James is saying we are divided, but the call in our lives is to be more like God. So you see, friends, the Christian struggle is not out there. The Christian struggle is the battle within every human heart. It is against our double-mindedness, our double selfness our double-heartedness. Our problem is not the pandemic or Donald Trump 
or Joe Biden. Our problem is our divided hearts. So what is the path to a united heart? What is the path against double-mindedness? Well, you might not like this, but the path to a united heart is the trials, the tribulations that God allows to come our way. The trials. Consider it all joy, my brothers, when you face trials of many kinds. Last week, uh, we were away, my family and I, because I was officiating a... uh, a wedding in Colorado for two members of our church, Holly Heitman, the former Holly Heitman, and Sebastian Rousseau. The wedding was in Estes Park, Colorado. And some of you may know Sebastian. Uh, Sebastian is, it was a professional swimmer. And we had dinner uh, a couple of nights before the wedding together, and I asked Sebastian, I said, when you were a professional swimmer, uh, how much would you swim in a given week? And he kind of, he looked up and he kind of did some quick math in his head, and he said, I estimate that, you know, at the peak of training, I was swimming about 80,000 yards a week. Now, let me put that into a little bit of context. You know your little pool at your uh, health club? It's about 25 meters or, or yards long. So that means that on a given week, he was touching the wall over 3,000 times, like 3,000 links, okay? Think about how much work that is. Think about the trial, the pain that that is. 80,000 yards in a week. But you know what the reward was? He swam in three Olympics. He walked in Beijing, in London, and in Rio. You see, the trial of all those laps was exactly what made him a great swimmer. There was no Olympics without the pain of those yards. Let me just say, kids, what does it take to get to the Olympics? 80,000 yards a week, okay? And for the Christian, there is no wholeness There is no undivided heart without trials. And we know this not because just James says it as a principle here, because we see it throughout Scripture. Think of what is most likely the oldest book written in the Scriptures, the book of Job. A man who lost his family, who lost his wealth, who lost his health. He went through trials so that he could get to the end of the book and say, My God, I consider you finally. It's the story of Abraham also who was displaced, who was taken. He had great wealth in the place he came from, but he went to a place and he never owned land again. He faced childlessness. He faced all, he lost family. He faced all kinds of things. It's the story of Joseph who spent the prime years of his life in prison. It's the story of Moses who spent 40 years in exile and then the next 40 years in the wilderness. It's the story of David, and of course, it is the story of Jesus, who had all the glory and the riches of heaven, but came to us and experienced the great trial so that we might know the great joy. The principle is this, is that in considering joy, because in joy we are made perfect and complete. Let me read verses three and four. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, And let steadfastness have its effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. That's the principle, okay? The trials of many kinds. And the trials could be anything from the displacement, the economic injustice and oppression that the folks in James are feeling to the things that you're feeling. Think about what the primary trial you are facing is today. What what is it? It may be a smaller thing. It may be a great thing, a loss of life. Just this week, I had news of one of my old friends, uh, great Christian family in Charlotte, North Carolina. They just took their youngest off to college. And just this week, the wife was put, 50 years old, was put on hospice with just days, just days to live. What is the trial you're facing? And is Dame a sadist? I mean, he's saying, consider it joy when you face these terrible trials. He's not a sadist. Nor is he an emotional repressor. I want to say this. I said this at the beginning of the summer. I need to say this again. Christian grief is legitimate. We talked about lament at the beginning of the summer. James is not just saying when you face a trial, stuff it and feel happy, put a happy face on it, okay? Too many Christians have done that and it harms our witness and it harms our life because there is such a thing as real Christian grief. But I think the Apostle Paul helps us when he says in 1 Thessalonians 4 that as Christians we grieve with hope. So James is not saying in the midst of your trials, push your grief down. He's not saying that. He's saying grieve, but grieve with hope. Because God uses the trials of our life to perfect our faith and to unite our hearts. And so that's the principle, learning to consider trials a joy because of the ways they mature us 
as Christians. Now, make no mistake, some of you are like, well, that's real, that's clever. That's like a cliche, a spiritual cliche. It's not that easy. And that's true. And so James gives us three ways of dealing with it. And I want to just basically work our way through the text. If you're ta- I know I've gone a long way. This is a long introduction. I've got just three things I want to say according to each of the paragraphs here. There's three things to lean into this. One, to ask for wisdom. Second, to tell yourself a new story. And third, to consider your reward. Because notice the principle, right? Consider it joy so that you can have trial when you face trials so that you may be mature and be complete, wholehearted. But you're like, I'm not joyful. I'm not joyful in the midst of my trials. I am lacking. James does something very deliberate. I need you to look with me to see this. If you see verse 4, it says you're lacking in nothing. You're going through trials and you're lacking in nothing. He picks up that very same word in verse 5 and says, if anyone lacks. What he's saying is that I know that you're lacking. I know that you're lacking. You won't fully get there until your eternal reward, until heaven. And so strategy number one Strategy number one for dealing with the trials that we faced is asking for wisdom because of our lack. Verse five, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach. James is saying, ask for wisdom so that you can understand and respond properly as you are able to the trials you are experiencing. The basic point is, are you taking your worries, are you taking your trials to God, trusting that he has a plan, asking not necessarily to see it, but to bear up under. Just think of the stories I told a minute ago from the Old Testament, the story of Job. He didn't know till the end of the story the blessing that would come to him, and Job had no idea of the blessing he would be to generations of people, that his story would bless generations of people who were going through hard times. The story of Joseph, who spent the prime years of his life in prison. He saw some of the deliverance that was his, but he had no idea during those prime years of his life what it would look like for those trials to produce joy and maturity. And then Moses, Moses never saw it. Moses was outside the promised land. He never saw what was promised, but he trusted God. He asked for wisdom. He saw the big picture. So the strategy number one is to ask for wisdom, to see where you fit in God's story. But secondly, second strategy for dealing with our trials and finding joy in them is telling yourself a new story. Telling yourself a new story. Now, I I showed you that there was a connection between verse 4 and verse 5. Verses 9, 10, and 11 don't appear to be connected. Let me read verse 9 and the first part of verse 10. This doesn't seem to be connected. Let the lowly or poor brother boast in his exaltation, and let the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. Now, on the one hand, poverty and wealth are major themes in the Scripture. Poverty and wealth are major themes in the teaching of Jesus. And as we will see, they're a major theme in the book of James. But how does this fit here in a section on trials? How does this discussion of poverty and wealth fit in a section about considering it all joy when you face trials? I believe that James is suggesting to us that in our poverty and wealth, Those are two of the chief threats, the chief trials to our faith. Poverty and wealth, how we deal with money, is one of the chief trials to our faith. Consider what one commentator said, love of money is the most common source of double-mindedness. And I would add, it's not just wealthy people who struggle with the love of money. That's a commentator. Consider the wisdom of the scriptures, Proverbs Chapter 30, verse 8, give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food that is needful for me, lest I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. Poverty and wealth. Consider the words of Jesus, who James appears to be channeling at this point and even echoing. Chapter 6, verse 24 of Matthew, Jesus says, No one can serve two masters. You cannot serve God and money. You can't be double-minded when it comes to money. Or even consider, if you will, my experience in 20 years as a pastor. I've never once had somebody come to me and say, You know, I really struggle with the love of money and I want to get over it. Not once. Nobody's ever come to me and said that. Because it's not the case? Hardly, right? Right? We don't say it because we don't see it, and the greatest threat is always the one you do not see. I do want to point out, a little bit tongue-in-cheek, that uh, poverty gets one line here, and riches get five lines. 
You see, the temptation of the impoverished and the suffering is to radicalize this message, but don't let those of us on the North Shore miss the temptation of those of us who are comfortable and have means is to trivialize this message. Because, friends, James will not let us off the mat. He's coming back to this. Let me just read uh, James chapter 5, verse 1. Come, th- this is from the Bible. Like, I'm just quoting. Come now, you rich. Weep and howl for the miseries coming upon you. Now, is James pounding this into our head because he's mean? No. He's pounding us in, this into our head because this, friends, has the opportunity to be the best news ever. Because whether your trial is poverty or wealth, what James is inviting us to, and I want us to see, is he's inviting you into the story of Jesus to see your story with the new eyes. Look with me. Verse 9, he's saying to the poor, take pride in your exalted status. That word there is a word that is applied theologically to Jesus in his exaltation, in his ascension, in his power. And then to the rich, take pride not in your money or your position, which are doomed to fade, but take pride in your humble status. Take pride in your, theologically and pastorally, this is genius. He's taking what is true of Jesus and his humiliation and his exaltation, and he's saying, apply this to yourself. You see, Jesus was humiliated for our sakes, and so therefore we can boast in our humiliation. And Jesus was exalted, which brings dignity to even the most downtrodden. At our church, I say about once a quarter that the gospel of God is that you are more wicked than you ever dared imagine and that you are more loved and accepted than you ever dared hope. Well, let me take that and give it an even more Christ focus and fit it to this verse. Because Christ was humiliated, you can face your humiliation, which is greater than you dared imagine. And because Christ was and will be exalted, you are united to him and will be exalted. The glory of Christianity is we are being written into the story of Jesus. The one who was ever full and complete, who was never double-minded, who was not dipsychos, and who passed through the greatest trial for the joy set before him. You see, friends, the way to meet the trials of life and to grow from them is to look for his story, to look for him in you. And for all of us who are wealthy, and if you're sitting here listening to my voice, you are wealthy. Maybe you don't feel wealthy, but on a world historical historical scale, you are very rich. Don't feel pride. Don't feel guilt. Don't feel shame. This is a great trial. Your wealth is a great trial. But you know what great trials have the potential to produce? Greatness. And particularly, great joy. Consider it all joy when you face trials of many kind. Ask for wisdom. Tell yourself the new story. And then I'll just read the last verse. Consider the reward. We don't talk enough about this. We will in the book of James. Consider your reward as you think about the trials you face. Blessed is the man, the woman, who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Consider your heavenly reward as you face the very real trials of your life. So friends, consider it all joy when you face trials of many kinds because you know that the testing of your faith is meant to produce steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. This is the word of the Lord. Let me pray for us. Our great God, James, is challenging us. He's coming to us with this hard word, but he comes to us with this great grace, especially the great grace of a new and better story, the story of your son. I pray that you would give us the grace to live into that story. And we pray this in the name of the one who makes it possible, Jesus Christ. Amen. We'll continue now in song. Please stand, put on a mask, and sing with me. The words of Psalm 27, Whom shall I fear? Let's all stand and sing. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is my Lord and salvation. 
stronghold for me Of whom should I be afraid Whom shall I fear The Lord is my light and salvation A stronghold for me Should I be afraid? Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart. And wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart. Wait for the Lord Be strong and take heart And wait for the Lord Be strong and take heart song is from Psalm 27, written by King David. And King David is someone who knew that in the midst of many trials that he faced to ask for wisdom, to tell himself a better and new story, and to consider his great reward. We're about to sing the doxology. We do so before we uh, talk. Uh, well, <laughs> and clear. Uh, if you would like to give to our church, we thank you so much. If you're our guest, our visitor, please feel no obligation to give. There are uh, envelopes on the table right there if you would like to mail in a check. We're not passing a basket, obviously, or you can give online. So thank you much for your generosity. But again, if you're our guest, please feel no obligation to give. Let's cultivate the new story. Let's ask for wisdom. Let's cultivate gratitude by singing the doxology. Sing with me. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. would invite you and encourage you, in fact, to hang out and spend time with one another. 
after the benediction, but please do pick up your chairs, your blankets, and move them out so the folks coming for the next service uh, can set their stuff up as they come in. But lift up your hearts, lift up your heads, and receive this good word from the Lord. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Go in the peace of Christ. Amen.